Today's content is brought to you by Algorand, which is the official sponsor of the Thinking Crypto channel and podcast. Algorand is building the technology to power the future of finance, the convergence of traditional and decentralized models into a unified system that is inclusive, frictionless, and secure. It is founded by Turing award-winning cryptographer Silvio McCalley. Algorand has developed a blockchain infrastructure that offers the interoperability and capacity to handle the volume of transactions needed for DeFi, financial institutions, and governments to smoothly transition into FutureFi. The technology of choice for more than 700 global organizations, Algorand is enabling the simple creation of next-generation financial products, protocols, and exchange of value. For more information, please visit algorand.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel, your home for crypto news and interviews. With me today is Jason Foster, who's the founder and president of Empower Oversight. Jason, great to have you on the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the invite. Jason, I'm very intrigued by all the, the things that Empower Oversight are doing. I love accountability. I love transparency. So I'm a big fan, and obviously Empower Oversight has uh, taken some action against the SEC regarding the Ripple lawsuit and crypto regulations and so forth. But before we get to that, tell us a bit about yourself. Where are you from, and and, uh, where'd you grow up? Uh, I'm originally from Arkansas. That's where I grew up. Um, And uh, after graduating from college there, I came up here to go to law school. I went to Georgetown Law uh, in 90. Three. That was a long time ago. Um, and uh, uh, after I got out of law school, I went to work on Capitol Hill um, and uh, worked for a member of Congress from Arkansas initially for the first year or so. And then I got to work on a uh, on the government reform and oversight committee on the House side. Uh, did that for six years and really got into doing oversight and investigations. Uh, and that's ex- that's basically what the rest of my career on the Hill was uh, about. Worked on Capitol Hill for 22 years, um, 14 of them uh, with Senator Chuck Grassley from Iowa. Uh, worked with him on the Senate Finance Committee, where we actually did a uh, did a big in-depth investigation uh, related to an SEC whistleblower uh, who was in the enforcement division there uh, and was wrongfully uh, terminated. He eventually got a settlement from the SEC and was vindicated. They were... Uh, preventing him from going after an insider trader, uh, insider trading case. They didn't want him to interview a particular witness because of that person's quote political clout. So we did a big investigation on that. There's a report about that. That's, uh, uh, linked to on our, on my bio. And, um, actually I'm still working with that whistleblower today, uh, with empower oversight, uh, Gary Aguirre. Um, so he advises, he's our general counsel and advises me on the uh, sec related stuff. So, Um, After that, after the Finance Committee, I went and worked on Judiciary Committee for Senator Grassley for uh, pretty much the entire eight years that he was the chairman and ranking member on that committee before, Um, so from 2011 to 2018. That's a little thumbnail in my career. And how did the idea of starting Empower Oversight come about? What was the genesis of the idea? And maybe you can give us an overview of the organization as well. Sure. Um, so for a long time, I had told people that there, you know, that there needed to be an organization, uh, like ours out there. Um, you know, there, there are lots of whistleblower groups, Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of sort of transparency and government oversight, good government groups out there. Um, but there isn't, I think what's unique about us is, um, you know, my vision is we are really trying to combine those two functions. We want you know, instead of just like a lot of groups will do a lot of FOIAs and they are just FOIAing, you know, everything under the sun. And they have a whole bunch of lawyers who, who file FOIA uh, freedom of information act requests. Um, You know, and then you have others who just exclusively work on whistleblower policy or, you know, who assist particular whistleblowers and represent them. And what I wanted to do is sort of combine those things into uh, one organization. Um, And, you know, so we are, we're doing, I'm doing a lot of the kinds of things that I used to do on Capitol Hill, but I'm just doing it from the private sector with a different set of tools. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I learned in working for Senator Grassley for a long time was, um, you know, even if an agency doesn't cooperate with you, 
you know, if you can get a whistleblower, if you can get someone on the inside who can give you information about where to look, what questions to ask, how to ask smart questions, you can be a lot more effective in doing uh, government oversight and transparency work. Um, so that's what I really, we want to advocate for. We want to be, we want to work with uh, folks on the Hill, folks in the uh, inspector general offices. Um, we want to work with the authorities that are there that are supposed to be providing oversight and transparency. And, you know, obviously freedom of information act is a big tool as well. And we're using that, you know, in this case with the, uh, with the sec. Absolutely. Um, some questions I have in the back of my mind about, whistleblowers. And we've seen multiple whistleblowers pop up over the years across the world, some in the United States. Do you th see, uh, maybe from a trend standpoint, that there's there are more whistleblowers now as a result of maybe the internet and information can easily be distributed that way? Uh, I, there certainly seems to, I, it's certainly easier than it used to be to get inside information out of an organization. And there are all kinds of implications uh, about that. Uh, there's, you know, whether it's national security or, you know, I actually deal a lot with law enforcement whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, one of the, one of the most uh, important uh, high profile cases, you know, in addition to the one with Gary at the SEC that I worked on in my career was with the ATF. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a whistleblower there who came to tell us about this um, uh, program where the ATF was essentially not interdicting illegal guns that were being uh, taken to Mexico. Mm. Uh, and there was a Border Patrol agent who had died um, as a result of guns that the ATF could have stopped, right, if it had done its job. And it was unclear at that point whether or not that information was going to become public. And this agent on the inside who was aware that one of the guns that had been trafficked right under the nose of the ATF, um, you know, was used in this in this uh, firefight that ended up killing this Border Patrol agent. So, um, you know, that became a big national scandal called Fast and Furious. That was the name of the operation. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it went on for years and years. And it was a big fight. We ended up the, the House ended up holding the attorney general in contempt over it for refusal to provide documents, et cetera. You know, but essentially we had already proved sort of the key aspects of the scandal and, you know, what the problems were before that fight even finished, because, you know, we had people on the inside who testified, who, you know, we had documents on the inside um, that were provided to us that, that made it undeniable that they weren't telling the truth when they denied, that when the ATF denied that this had occurred. And so that's sort of the power of information, right? Um, Information sort of, you know, it's it, like you said, it flows much easier nowadays with technology. Um, it's it, it's really hard to hide uh, facts, you know, yeah. and now, you know, uh, what I see a lot with the crypto community that's interesting that I've seen in other contexts as well is just the enormous power of sort of crowdsourcing, too. And yeah. you have people on Twitter and other social media you know, who are just digging out, you know, finding speeches that have important information in them, finding, highlighting that, analyzing it, you know, there's sort of a, you know, you can sort of harness the crowdsourced brain power, right, to, to, to find little nuggets of information and the, the dots to start to put together the, you know, uh, the pieces of a puzzle, you know, um, and it's just, you know, it's fascinating, you have to, you know, you have to take it with a grain of salt, and you have to verify stuff, uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of power in that, not only in the crypto community, but in other spaces. I've seen a lot of that on online. And I really you know, it's really useful for people who are in official positions, mm. uh, you know, to, I think, watch those things to take to take the good, you know, to take it with the separate the wheat from the chaff, you know. Uh, but there's you know, it's amazing what you can what the power of the technology can surface, uh, you know, the details that can, um, you know, you can discover that way. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. The internet itself, that, that paradigm shift, so many things uh, are happening around it. Obviously you have crypto, you have better communication, you have the ability to create content. And to your point, people can crowdsource and come together like never before and organize and take action. It's, it's pretty amazing what's happening like never before in history. Yeah, one of one of our major projects, uh, one of our other major projects at Empower Oversight is a, uh, uh, you know, we're looking at the origins of the COVID nineteen virus, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, and one of the one of our first projects was we did a crowdsource of a time of a, a timeline about the origins of the virus. And the you know there's this debate about whether it could be a lab leak or whether um, you know it's of natural origin. Um, and you know there's just a tremendous amount of information out there in the scientific community and people academics who are posting and you know they're often very generous with their time and willing to help and if you put out a call and hey here's our timeline take a look you know tell us if you have any edits or if we got anything wrong and you get tons of feedback you can incorporate that and you can sort of re you know on an iterative process you can put out the timeline again and post it again and solicit more feedback and and it's you know it's great um so Jason, I'm going to ask a question, and this may seem like a rookie question to ask you, but you know, an organization such as such as yourself, exposing a lot of information, uh, holding people accountable, many who may not like that. Do you ever worry about retaliation and that, hey, you and the folks who work at Empower Oversight, anything could happen in that way? Sure, um, you know, I mean, I. It was the same when I was, you know, uh, in my career on Capitol Hill. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of the work that I did, you know, made people um, unhappy or uncomfortable if they were, you know, if if they were part of it. I always was working on really controversial things, um, and so I'm sort of just used to that. Um, and you know, but the key is, you know, just just focus on what the facts are. Don't go beyond what the facts are. Um, you know, o- only, only say what you can support. Um, and, uh, you know, l- let's figure out what, you know, when there's a controversy, let's figure out what happened and then everybody can have their opinions about it later, but like, let's figure out what the facts are. That's always been my focus. Um, and, you know, people, you know, like with the, as I'm sure a lot of your viewers know, you know, government often h- tries to hide behind deliberative process privilege, right. With, uh, you know, withholding stuff through the freedom of information act, um, and, you know, that's about what advice was given and what, you know, pre-decisional information and, you know, what were the agents, were the people of the agency thinking, you know, before they formulated the policy and what should the policy be? None of that is my focus, right? My focus is what are the facts? What happened, right? And you can't, um, you know, deliver process privilege can't be used to withhold facts. And so, you know, who... Who spoke to whom on what date, right? You know, especially when you talk about external communications, like the type that you know we're seeking uh, in our FOIA. Um, so, you know, that's always been my motto: is sort of like, well, let's all figure out what the facts are together first, and then everybody can have their opinions about it, <laughs> right? right. Um, how- uh, and of course, and of course, protecting whistleblowers from retaliation is a big, you know, is a big issue in the whistleblower community. And so, for whistleblower advocates. Um, you know, like myself, I mean, that's part of what, that's part of the reason that we exist as well is because we can be there to help people make a protected disclosure. And there are legal protections if you're an insider with information, right? Depending on where you are, they're very complex. uh, And that's why we're here to help people with that. But, um, you know, one major protection always from a practical point of view is anonymity. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, people can contact us anonymously um, and provide information. And, you know, if it's verifiable and it can be used as the basis for one of our FOIA requests or some other letter or inquiry that we want to make or a further investigation, you know, that's perfectly fine. And, you you know, by working through a lawyer or through an organization such as mine, you know, you can, you can make a disclosure um, in a way that protects your anonymity. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's a key way to protect against retaliation as well, because if they don't know who to retaliate against, they can't retaliate against them. Sure. Now, how are you guys funded? How do you pay for your operations? Um, once again, this may be a rookie question. Uh, I, I, I should have done maybe my research here, but I want to get some insight. Is it folks donating, helping out? How yeah. Do you your yeah. 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 We have a donate button on our website. Uh, it's uh, supported by individuals. You know, I've, um, uh, I'm, I'm no longer with government. I had a 22 year career in government, you know, so um, I'm able to devote, you know, myself full time to it. And I've got other people who volunteer, uh, you know, um, we, we are using money from individuals and other donors who, uh, you know, to help pay for, you know, the, uh, uh, the law firm that we've hired to represent us uh, with the SEC. This is our, 
Our SEC lawsuit is the second one we filed so far. Our first one was with the NIH. It's on that COVID origins project that I told you about. Um, you know, so we're, we have a broad focus on a lot of different topics. Um, and, you know, we're going to litigate when we have to. And, you know, yeah, that costs money. And so when we, uh, you know, we, we appreciate all the support and donations that we can get to help us do that. Well, I for sure will be donating. Uh, I, like I said at the beginning of the video, I appreciate the, the transparency um, and the accountability that you, you, you all bring into the table for where our tax dollars are going, what our governments are doing. Um, and let's talk about the SEC. Tell us about how you and the folks at Empower Oversight came across this uh, lawsuit situation. And I want to get your perspective on it and all the reportings of conflicts of interest. People are very angry and upset. They're seeing all these things, like you said, the research and the speeches and the meetings and so forth. So tell us, you know, from your perspective, what, what you're seeing. Sure. Um, well, so as I said, you know, Gary Aguirre, who works with me, uh, you know, is a former SEC whistleblower um, and a former SEC attorney. Uh, and uh, he's also written, actually, after his SEC career, he became a whistleblower attorney. Uh, and uh, he has actually written quite a bit uh, on crypto issues. Um, so it's not something I had followed as much, uh, uh, you know, before this necessarily. Uh, but, you know, we um, obviously we, you know, we, we scan the news and the newspapers and, and articles for, um, you know, it's just something I did when I was on the Hill too. You know, one of the ways you look for issues to get involved in and, and to, uh, you know, sort of start pulling threads on is to just look around and see what's, what's going on out there that's controversial and what are people, uh, what are people getting upset about and why, and is there some, some additional sunlight and transparency that can be brought to that uh, issue, right? So, you know, we saw the reports. Um, if you look through our complaint um, and, and in fact, and, and our FOIA request itself, you know, we lay out all the all the articles and, and news reports and so forth, where people were raising this as a, as a potential issue. Uh, and it seemed to me, you know, I, I, I saw that there was this fight over delivery process and in and, and, uh, Ripple's, uh, you know, requests for information and discovery in the lawsuit. And I thought, well, well, wait a minute, if people have a concern that there's a potential conflict here, well, why don't we just look for communications with the ethics office and communications with their, you know, with their, the people that they went to work for or the people that they used to work for. Um, and let's just ask for those because there isn't any deliberate, pro you know, when you're talking about communications with outsiders or communications with the ethics office, you know, a lot of that's not going to be deliberate process privilege. Uh, it's not going to be pre-decisional information. So they should have to disclose that to the extent that there might be any, any records like that. Um, and so, you know, we did the FOIA request, mm. um, didn't know what would happen, didn't know whether they'd be responsive and non-responsive, although I wasn't holding my breath. Uh, and, uh, you know, the first thing they did was they did not, you know, they tried to tell us that we were going to have to pay a whole bunch of fees. They were going to treat us as a, they weren't going to treat us as a news media requester or a requester that, uh, you know, they're going to treat us as someone who had a financial interest. Right, mm. which we didn't, we, you know, because they charge high fees to, to companies who are doing it, you know, for their own personal, you know, or uh, commercial purposes, right? Um, but that's not us. We're a nonprofit. We're 501c3 educational organization. Um, you know, we were entitled and we publish everything. You know, we, we're very transparent. We publish everything on our website, all the FOIA requests as we make them. The responses that we get from the agencies, you know, they're all up there. We issue our press releases. Um, and, you know, we have an email list and, you know, we do all that stuff. So, you know, we should, and other groups like ours have been treated as quote media requesters where they don't have to pay huge fees to mm. get, to get records. So we appealed that decision because that was going to make it impossible. We're a small nonprofit. There was no way we would be able to pay those high fees. Like a, you know, like a Bloomberg or somebody like that would be able to pay. Um, so we appealed that decision and we won. Um, and, you know, we posted the appeal and we posted the decision uh, in our favor on that. Uh, and then, you know, time just kept ticking away and they were beyond their um, statutory deadlines. You know, they're supposed to respond within 20 business days unless there's something that extends that. Uh, you know, like if there's if there's some kind of special extenuating circumstances, 
or unusual circumstances, they can extend the deadline. But the, the basically we were we weren't getting any communications from the SEC other than here's two categories of your eight categories that we already did our search for and we couldn't find anything. But there was no indication and no, you know, a lot of times agencies will actually communicate with you and they'll tell you, you know, um, oh, we're, you know, we've pulled this many records. We've got this many that we're going through. They're being reviewed. It's going to take us some time. And, they'll get, and if, you, if you get a sense that they're actually cooperating, you know, then you can be more patient. Mm -hmm. um, but we basically heard nothing other than here's these two categories where there's nothing. And then it's radio sign, you know, and then they denied our, you know, then they tried to charge us a bunch of money and then they changed their mind on that after we appealed. But other than that, we had no, like, it wasn't like we were getting a FOIA officer calling us and saying, okay, I've gathered, you know, we got 10,000 records. We got to go through them and figure out which exemptions we can redact what for, you know, there was nothing. So, you know, so we looked into, you know, enforcing our, our rights to the documents in court um, and ended up drafting the complaint and filing it. We filed it last uh, Wednesday and you know, we announced it Friday morning. Um, and within two hours, actually, I'll, I'll give you some news that we haven't announced yet. So within two hours after us uh, or so of us uh, announcing publicly that we had filed the suit, we actually got responses on two more of our eight categories from the SEC. I wonder what what sparked that response. <laughs> I don't know if it was the press release or if it was just you know happenstance, but um, uh, they did they did discover. If you look at actually, I don't know, you might want to put this up on the screen later for your for your viewers. But if you look at pages six and seven of our uh, of our complaint in district court. Uh, uh, we have there listed what all of our requests were. Mm -hmm. So the first two that they had uh, told us before we filed that they hadn't found any records are uh, uh, on um, were the ones that are listed there on page seven as uh, F and H. Uh, so when we filed our suit, we were still, uh, we hadn't had any response from them on A, B, C, D, E, and G. Mm -hmm. Well, Two hours after we filed, they told us, oh, yeah, we also don't have any records for A and B. So A and B are the ones where we were seeking communications with Hinman, uh, any communications between Hinman and Simpson Thatcher, and C uh, and B, rather, is where we were seeking any communications between Hinman and the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. So those are the two additional ones after we made our announcement on Friday that they have now said they also have no response documents for. So that leaves four categories out of the eight where we still don't have a reply from them. And those are the ones that we're, you know, we're still going to be pressing them for. Now, when they say they don't have any records, uh, can, can that be trusted or could they be lying or, or it's, you know, how, how does that work? Yeah. So they, I mean, um, we don't have any evidence that, that they're not telling the truth. We can probe and ask them questions about what kind of search they did. And the way the law works is they have to demonstrate that they've done a, a, a search that's reasonably likely to come up with responsive documents, right? So they have to, they have to do, you know, that's the standard. So if you were to, if you were to go to court and say, you know, well, we don't believe, you know, uh, we don't believe that you did a reasonable search for A and B, uh, you know, tell us what you did to search for them. And well, that's not adequate. You, you could have looked here. You know, if they say, well, we pulled the email records for Mr. Henman, you know, and we performed the following keyword searches, right, then they and, and there were no responses. Um, you know, then that's a perfectly reasonable response. And there's nothing really, you know, you can say about that unless you have an insider telling you, hey, they're not telling you the truth. Uh, but the other thing to remember is, you know, we were just looking to see if there might, you know, we didn't know whether there were any communications in any of these categories. We were just asking to see if there were. And then the other issue is, you know, these are obviously we can only ask for what the government, what the SEC has in its files. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if the if 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 the people that we named here were having communications on personal devices, with the end of, you know, with the organizations named, obviously that's not going to come up in an SEC, um, you know, in an SEC record search. So, 
you know, it doesn't mean that there were no communications. It just means that the SEC did a search and that search did not come up with any in the SEC files. Hmm. Um, you know, you mentioned you did your list of uh, respective items, A through H, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, tell us about, you know, you mentioned A and B. Can, would you be able to walk through what C, D? Yeah. So forth? Yeah. So the ones that are still pending, the ones that we the, that they still should be searching for responsive records are, they haven't told us they've been unable to find any. So these are the ones that are still pending. So C, which may be the most important. C is the one that deals with communications between uh, Hinman and anybody in the um, Office of Ethics about his payments from Simpson Thatcher while he was still at the SEC or any negotiations with Simpson Thatcher, um, you know, before he left the SEC. Um, and D is the one that deals with records of Mr. Berger, Mark Berger and Simpson Thatcher. Uh, C is the one that deals with records between Mr. Berger and the Enterprise um, Ethereum Alliance. Uh, then F is one a category where they've said they don't have any. And then G is, uh, which is still live, is all records relating to communications uh, with Mr. Clayton and people from One River Asset Management. So that's another one that they should still be searching for records from. Mm. Now, through this process, have you at all been in, in communication with the folks um, at the SEC as it relates to Gary Genser or the other commissioners? No, and I wouldn't. That wouldn't. I wouldn't expect to. Um, you know, we're going to be dealing with their FOIA officers and their general counsel's office uh, to the extent that we deal with anybody there. And as I said before, you know, we we haven't had much communication from their FOIA office. Hmm. You know, it's only been official. There's been no informal communications with their FOIA office, which is, you know, in my experience in other agencies that, you know, if they're if they're going to be cooperative, you're going to get informal communications. You know, they might call you and ask, you know, or you might call them to ask for a status. They might call you and say, hey, you know, we're not sure what you really want by this request. You know, they might ask you to narrow it or could we redefine it a different way or, you know, it'd be easier for us to search if we could look for it this way. You know, you have a dialogue. Um, we've had none of that with the SEC. It's been just absolutely, you know, your request for fee waivers denied. Then we filed our appeal. Okay, never mind. We'll give you your fee waiver that you that you're entitled to. And then it's, hey, we found no records here. We found no records here. That's it. The no no actual like engagement or dialogue with them. Wow. Um, now you filed a suit. Let's say. Uh, things to go according to plan and you get the respective data, your information you're looking for, what would be the next step? What would it be to show that to the public respectfully? Yes. And then that could be incorporated into the lawsuits that are happening. Well, I mean, and once it's public, anybody can do whatever they want with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, and we said, and in our FOIA request itself, that we, that's why we wanted to be treated as a media requester because we do intend to publish, you know, um, uh, Whatever the results are, I mean, if the results are, hey, none of these people had any untoward community, you know, any communications that raise any suspicions, then that's what we'll, you know, report out. I mean, we've already reported out, hey, that four of the categories that they've searched for, they were unable to find any records. Right? It doesn't mean no such communications existed, but at least there were none at the SEC, according to the SEC. Sure. And again, if any, you know, if they, if that's not true. Uh, you know, then I would hope that somebody on the inside who knows that would, you know, speak up and, you know, they're always free to contact us confidentially. We have a contact form on our website. Anybody who, you know, has any information about any of these requests, you know, they're, they're free to contact us directly and let us know and we can, they can do that confidentially and we'll protect their identity. And, um, you know, so that gives me, and hopefully the public, you know, some level of confidence that they're going to, you know, there's, there's a big downside for them if they're not telling the truth. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on the, the, the fact that all of this is happening? Um, you guys are trying to get uncover the information there and you have on the other one side, Congress meeting with Genser. Genser wants more power to, to control the crypto market. Um, and, you, on the other side, you have John Deaton representing XRP holders. 
there's there's a lot of moving parts and components to this um and a lot of work that you're doing now and the folks at empire oversight could have huge impacts on both sides you know what are your thoughts from the macro perspective of what's happening well we i mean we don't any we don't take any position one way or the other on the you know the merits of the sec's lawsuit against ripple or you know i mean that's 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 related to our request, but you know we're a public integrity and accountability organization. So you know our focus is on, hey, there's a large segment of the public that clearly does not believe, right? They th- that clearly believes there was an appearance of impropriety here, mm-hmm. um, and so that you know that's the motivation for us to do the request, right? Because. If there's, you know, because there are documents that should be producible in FOIA that would that would inform the public one way or the other, whether or not those concerns are legitimate or whether or not those concerns are unfounded, you know, and one of the aspects of transparency throughout my career that I've always, you know, tried to argue that agencies should pay more attention to is, you know, you shouldn't just fight the release of information because like that's the default position and you're always going to be for less release of information. I mean, if there's a large segment of the public that has lost confidence in your objectivity, then it you should lean forward on being more transparent to reassure them if that's not true, that it's not true and show them the evidence, right? right. Open your, show them, you know, um, you know, I, I, that, that's the best way to reassure the public and to, and to increase public confidence that you're being fair and objective. Is to be is to be open, um, you know. It, it's transparency is just sort of the you know it's sort of the cure all for the for that. And the more you resist transparency, then you know the more people are going to wonder, well, why aren't they answering the, these are reasonable questions? Why aren't they answering them? Why are they working overtime to come up with forty seven excuses to why not the answer? Why not? Why they shouldn't be able to answer the question? Yeah, absolutely, and and I think. Because as we talked about initially, the internet, people are seeing this and they're coming together and are talking about this and they're getting more upset and they're bringing more people into the ranks. And, and like you said, the trust is just devaluing over time in, in, in the SEC. Um, pers- even myself, I, I, now I'm like, why does the SEC even exist? I mean, it, it, I, yes, con- you know, retail investors need to be protected, but it seems the SEC has moved far away from that core value or mission. Um, and, and I could be a bit jaded because of this lawsuit, but uh, I, I think like many others, we, we've lost faith. We've lost trust in the SEC. Well, that's exactly, as I said, that's exactly when agencies should lean forward and be the most transparent, when there's a problem in the perception of themselves out there. You know, but the, unfortunately, you know, it's just bureaucrats often don't think that way. You know, they just think like, oh, we've got to protect. We can't, you know, we can't release too much. You know, we've got to protect. We got to. They're often thinking about the next case and the next case, you know, like we can't set a precedent and release this information, you know. But if it's a good story for you, then why not? And if it's a, you know, because people are going to assume if you don't, whatever you don't release, people are going to assume the worst. Yeah. It's just human nature. But it's almost, it's it's a bit frustrating because when you think about it, I pay my taxes, so so many uh, American residents and citizens, and then we're expecting the government to work on behalf of of our benefits and to, to help us. Uh, but yet there's this level of secrecy, and like you said, it's a bit of bureaucracy. It, it, how and I question this philosophically. Like, how did we get here? <laughs> how do we fix this as well? Uh, Maybe it's more. I, w- I wish I had a magic wand. <laughs> I think you just have to do the hard work. You know, I mean, that's why FOIA is a great thing. Um, yeah. You know, and you know, anybody can file a FOIA request. Um, you know, it puts obligations on them to do the work, to do the searches, and to produce the documents uh, unless they're exempt. And you know, it's just that you you got to have people out there willing to do that hard work to hold their to hold the people in authority accountable. You know, I mean, you know. Um, you know, we talk on our website about being, you know, we're, we're public integrity through the power of information, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're about. Um, and, you know, it's not just, 
you know, whistleblowers need to be protected. They need to feel safe to come forward and they need to be protected and they need to be able to come, you know, bring information forward and report wrongdoing. But what often happens in the whistleblower space is people get tied around the axle on, it all becomes about the whistleblower and was it justified or not justified? Are they a good whistleblower or not? Are they legit? You know, did, is what they, you know, but all that really matters is, is what they said true. Right. And, and if it is, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so a big part of our mission, you know, that I think is unique is, you know, we're trying to actually go out there and hold the agency accountable as well. Right. Um, you know, if somebody's going to report wrongdoing, you know, you have all these people out in the public who have a loss of confidence that the, the SEC is being objective on the, on the regulation of cryptocurrencies. Well, you know, well, the solution to that is transparency. So let's see. And if there aren't any conflicts and, you know, there's nothing to any of any of these concerns, then okay. But let's show the public, you know, let's show our work. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there, there's some questions that came from the community. Uh, I don't know if you can answer them uh, because they're more maybe on the legal side, but what can XRP holders do uh, against the SEC? Could, could, could we file a civil case against them? Uh, could we form a, uh, excuse me, sign some petition to, have Gary Genser removed? <laughs> are there any options here that uh, the people who are XRP holders can t- uh, take? Well, they can contact their representatives in Congress. One thing that would be helpful would be if there was more oversight um, and bipartisan oversight in particular, uh, you know, from from members on Capitol Hill, both in the House and the Senate. Um, you know, so it's important to have people who are on the key committees. You know, who are on the banking committee. Um, but it's also important just for people to contact their own representative and, and you know, make sure that they are aware of, of your concerns and, and that you want more aggressive oversight of the SEC and how it's handling this issue. So that's one thing you can do. You can also, as I said, anybody can file a FOIA request. Mm. Uh, you know, there could be more FOIA requests for, for identical or similar information than, than as what we're seeking. Um, you know, we... Uh, organizations all the time feed, you know you learn from each other and and you know dig deeper and get more granular on your request um and uh you know i mean as far as litigation i mean i'm not a securities lawyer so you know i would i, I would punt on that question you know i would i would say it's you know somebody who's um uh, who's more versed in that would have to answer that i don't know what kind of rights that there might be uh for xrp holders for the damage that they believe they've suffered as a result of the sec's action um i would my gut tells me that that's probably a long shot but you know like i said i'm not i'm not expert in that area for sure um what other uh financial or investment cases are you, are you guys currently working on if any um Obviously, this one is a big, a big one, but uh, are there others, whether it relates to stock market or whatever it may be? Um, so, well, there's, um, we're always evaluating things that people are bringing to us and people are often bringing us things in that space. Um, but the, I can only, I'll talk about the, the, the one other that we have that's public right now is a case regarding the VA, mm-hmm. the Veterans Administration. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been, uh, we have some whistleblower disclosures there and we've been working on that for several months. Basically, uh, without getting too much into the weeds, the story uh, has to do with potential uh, insider trading and uh, potential short selling based on information that the Veterans Affair, that the Veterans uh, Administration had that may have leaked out, you know, that was material, non public information about a particular, about some publicly traded companies that they were regulating. So they regulate GI Bill benefits. And so there are some uh, for-profit education companies that are publicly held. And they were going to take a big uh, enforcement action. And they announced that they were going to take that big enforcement action. But there's movement in the stock price of those companies prior to the public announcement. So you had government employees, bureaucrats who had X, who knew this was coming. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you had movement in the stock before the public announcement. Um, and, uh, you know, there's there's a long, long story about connections between the people inside government and some activists on the outside who may have leaked that to allies and so forth. So. Um, wow. So the, we the, all that's Yeah, you can if you go and look on our website for stuff related to the Veterans Affairs Administration, you'll see all that. And I've written some articles about it, too. 
Um, I'll say once again, I appreciate the work you guys are doing. Um, this is certainly important. And uh, I want to jump to just some wrap up questions here, such as do you hold any cryptocurrencies? Are you invested in any? And, and if so, which ones? No. Okay. <laughs> None. Uh, well, are you are you curious about uh, Bitcoin or anything in the market at least? Where you're like um, researching it and things like that. I I'm not I'm not really you know I I'm really boring with my investments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know it's uh, it's all in the it's all in my government you know thrift <laughs> savings plan and uh, yeah. you know my four hundred one k and that's it. Well, not a, not a big investor, actually, myself, you know, in terms of like, you know, act, I'm certainly not an active trader of anything. Sure. Well, you know, there's talks of uh, crypto coming to many 401k accounts. So you, eventually you might indirectly be exposed to it. But uh, uh, no, no problem that you don't hold it. But I was just curious if, if that was uh, the case. Yeah. Well, I have no. Yeah. So I have no personal financial interest at all one way or the other. Right. Got it. Got it. Well, have you heard of the metaverse at all? Uh, I've heard talk of metaverses, yes, or the concept, yeah. Well, I, this may be a, a left field question for you then. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, but if you could create your own metaverse, what would it be about? Oh, my gosh. Uh, that I, that sounds horrible. I don't know that I would want to create a metaverse. <laughs> well, the real world is so much more interesting. <laughs> Well, I can't disagree with you there. Uh, you know, even being someone who's into technology and crypto, the metaverse still is something that I'm coming to grasp with. And, and, and I do fear what the impact it may have on the future generation and people being caught up so much in the digital world is even more than what they are now. Oh, yeah. I think that we're, we're, we're just now trying to, you know, we're just now in the infancy of dealing with all the changes that, I mean changes it has on human behavior. And I mean, it's far reaching, you know, it's like being in the middle of a, you know, of a major cultural shift. Um, but yeah, no, I'd much rather like, you know, get out on a hiking trail or, <laughs> you know, do something actual, you know, with the real universe. For sure. All right. Some quick rapid fire questions, favorite food. Uh, oh man. I like so much. Any, any food, any food that I didn't have to make. <laughs> take out <laughs> yeah good uh, well you know a good grilled piece a good grilled or smoked piece of meat uh that would probably yeah yeah can can go wrong with that um yeah. musician favorite musician or band oh goodness um tie between billy joel and led zeppelin which is an odd combination but um <laughs> Both, both great. Uh, yeah. Plus anything sort of new, like new grass Americana, you know, folk stuff. I love. Um, I would lean more to Zeppelin, but both great. I mean, can, yeah. Uh, favorite movie? Uh, well, since it's the Christmas season, um, it's a wonderful <laughs> life, right? I mean, that's the greatest. Classic. Uh, favorite book? Yeah. Um, Wow, you, it, it changes depending on what month you ask me. Uh, but um, I'll say "Crime and Punishment," Dostoevsky. Mm. And when you're not at Empower uh, Oversight, what, what are you doing for fun as a hobby? Uh, well, like I said, out on a hiking trail, or you know, uh, driving somewhere to visit, or going to a. Uh, my daughter plays a competitive. Uh, she's a competitive Scottish fiddler. And so wow. I go to Celtic, Celtic uh, festivals up and down the East Coast before she went off to college anyway, where she would compete. So we loved doing that. That's awesome. Um, I, 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 it's awesome that that still is a thing where people play and, and compete and so forth. Yeah. Some of these uh, traditional things like this, they kind of fade away over time, but it's, yeah. still, it's still still present. Yeah, we enjoy uh, it. Jason, pleasure chatting with you. And thank yeah, you thanks for having me on. For the great work you're doing um, in bringing transparency and accountability to, to the uh, government. Uh, and uh, I will certainly be donating and I encourage uh, my watch viewers and, and listeners to also do the same. But thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.